Murray. For those of you here for ACME, we are now actively soliciting a Jabber relay. If, oh, Joe. Well, we will also now be actively soliciting note takers. Joe, having leapt on, on Jabber Relay, is now out of the note taker thing. Now I'm looking at Robin, who is seriously <laughs> silly, but. No. Uh, Etherpad is fine, but we really don't need he said, she said. We're looking for uh, results. So it was decided that uh, actions is all we're looking for. Uh, we, we have one thing. Thank you. All right. Uh, so uh, thanks to Robin and Joe. We, we are already ahead of the game because we have identified. So let's stickers to give away. No, uh, yeah, I'm so used to giving away stickers. I'm to give away stickers. the same link that they do about her and the they didn't put them in this time. This is the virtual stickers go to. So the question is, will the, will the minutes be two lines? One, approved draft two, not meeting any. <laughs> this would be a fine set of minutes to turn in. Yeah. I do not believe our area directors would be upset with those minutes at all. Final draft approved, working group closing. This right. is a great set of minutes. Yeah. For those of you who are remote, uh, welcome Eric, Sean, Thomas, and Carl. Uh, can you wave in the Jabber room uh, that you can hear us? Anybody in Jabber to see them read, waving? They are waving. Eric, or Okay. So if any of them were replied, yeah. they heard, and therefore, yeah. Our yeah. All right. So. 
So the blue, blue seats are circulated. We have a jabber scribe and we have a note taker. Thank you to Robin and Joe. Um, you are in Berlin. If you did not seek to be in Berlin, welcome anyway. But welcome uh, uh, This is the note well. If you haven't been in an IETF before, um, you have not seen this. If you have been in an IETF before, you've seen it many, many times. The note well is a brief pointer for certain values of brief. Um, to our uh, IPR-related uh, RFCs, please review the RFCs. If you have not done so, they describe the duties you have taken on. Should you make a contribution, that includes either messages to the mailing list, uh, discussion at the mic, interpretive dance, um, smoke signals, really quite a broad thing. Uh, please be aware of what duties you are taking on should you endeavor to communicate to the working group. And now, the agenda. This is the point at the agenda where you are allowed to agenda bash. It's one of the administrivia pieces. Um, we plan to discuss the ACME issue list, go through the review of changes to the document and uh, upcoming changes, what preparations we need to take on for working group last call. Uh, we've allocated some time for that. And then 40 minutes for what's next? Should we quietly close down? or soldier on into new and uncharted territories which would need to be chartered. Uh, is there any bashing of the agenda as presented? Seeing none, I invite uh, our esteemed document author who is wearing an appropriately pink shirt to stand in the pink box. Um, the, the pink box, oh, oh interpretive it's, dance. It's um, very interpretive. Is, is that cover, uh, that's covered by NetWell, yeah. 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 I, I have no IPR that I know of in that interpretive dance. Yeah, I, I, I'm not aware of any IPR on that. He has to dance. reasonably and personally know if there is IPR covering the interpretive dance, and he has said he does not. How about all right. Skills? Next slide. Uh, I think Ted already said all these. Um, we had a rather rushed set of changes going up to the internet draft deadline, so I figured we'd spend some time going through what we actually what the changes were that went into the document in case we want to back some of them out just to make sure that we're everyone's okay uh, with the things that went in. Um, then I've got a, a list of open questions, um, mix of things that are in the issue tracker on GitHub, and a couple of things that are noted in the document that kind of came up came to mind as we were making some of the changes in, the, in this draft, and then. I think the the goal here is to get to a lot a, a, a list of kind of kind of a punch list for the last few things we have to do to get to uh, last call because the chairs keep reminding me that they were hoping to get a last call at this IETF um, and maybe it's going to slip a couple months but I think it's still the end is in sight so let's uh, the goal of this this session I think is to get to what else we need to do uh, to consider start considering this done next slide please and keep going. So um, this is the usual metric slide, uh, copied and pasted from GitHub. 27 pull requests from last time. Um, yeah, there was some complaining on the mailing list about the spike of activity around the draft deadline, and that is completely legitimate. Um, as I'll discuss later, uh, the other authors and I have had some conversations about having a more rhythmic pace uh, after this IETF and getting things done a little more smoothly. So that's an acknowledged problem we'll try and uh, Try and do better next time. Next slide, please. So I want to call out a few highlights uh, from the changes that were made uh, in this last rev. Uh, there are a couple of security changes we made. Um, the one I hadn't thought about at all um, was some came along and pointed out the risk of server-side request forgery. Who has heard of server-side request forgery in this room? This was new to me when this issue was posted. Um, I think I'd seen these attacks before, but hadn't heard that phrase for them. Um, what this guy pointed out was that um, the HTTP challenge type um, causes the, the CA, the server, to go make an HTTP request out to the validation server to verify the, uh, the client's control of that domain name. And it's a very structured request to try and minimize the surface, minimize the control the client can do. But the filer, the guy who filed the issue pointed out that um, if that valid, if that server is malicious, then he can cause, he can send a redirect response. And if the CA follows redirects, then he'll go send an, a, an HTTP get query to that server. And so if you have a 
server that's going to pass back some information from that he got from that uh, get request, then it's possible for an attacker to get some information from an arbitrary server on the internet from the vantage point of the CA. Um, and this can be a, a, a risk if there's, say, internal web services inside the CA infrastructure that you might be able to get out and get information this way. Uh, so this came to mind. Uh, the reporter noticed that uh, the implementation of Acme that's being used by Let's Encrypt actually has some of this risk in that uh, the error reporting that the, the server provides has of the first few bytes of the response from the validation server to facilitate debugging. So if there were some vulnerable web services inside of Let's Encrypt's infrastructure, it was possible that, a, that an attacker could have extracted those first few bytes of the response. So this is just a clarification to say, you really should um, make sure that your infrastructure doesn't have any web services that are gonna do anything and, and uh, that, that you wouldn't want people to be uh, accessing, really make sure that the things doing your HTTP validations can only talk to the internet, can only talk to things that are publicly accessible because that's what it's there for. Um, so that's mainly a clarification, some operational considerations. Um, pull request number 150, uh, we made, in response to Karthik's, uh, Karthik's analysis and some operational uh, learnings from Let's Encrypt, we made some changes to the key rollover transaction on how the signatures were arranged. And in the process of that, omitted one of the things that we needed to sign over. I think the signature was, uh, had signatures by the new key and the old key covering the new key. <laughs> when in reality, you need to cover both the old key and the new key to signify that both the old key and the new key consented to the, the, the transition, not just the new key. So there's some replay risk in the old structure. Change the signature format to cover it. Uh, cover both keys now, so that's that's fixed. Uh, there's a little bit more fiddling to do with that a little bit later in slides. It's an open issue. Also following on from Karthik's analysis, Karthik noted that uh, with the limited replay, or um, not replay protection, we had this resource field in the JWS signing that said the type of Acme resource you were sending something to. So I'm sending this to the new authorization resource or to a challenge resource or to a registration resource. Uh, Karthik's analysis pointed out what we sort of already knew, which is that if you have an intermediary that can shuffle these responses, then they can shuffle responses around within those resource classes, and there's some risks that arise uh, due to that shuffling. So as we discussed at the last IETF meeting, we changed from using this resource field to using the full URL to which the thing is sent. Um, and I want to dive into that a little bit so on the next slide. So, yeah, we took this resource field and changed it into URL. So now when the server gets a signed object from the client, it's supposed to take that URL field and compare it to the request URI of the request um, and make sure that they're semantically the same thing. Uh, now, we had this big discussion. I think we spent 20 or 30 minutes on it at the last IETF meeting about how comparing URIs is non-trivial, especially when you're deriving one of them from the parameters you get in the HTTP request. So there's kind of some weasel words in the current spec saying that you have to compare the URL parameter to the request URI. And if they do not match, then you consider the request unauthorized. Um, this, like I said, feels kind of weaselly, and I would love suggestions for how to improve this. Ted, you're looking pensive. Uh, Ted Hardy from the floor microphone. Um, so I, I believe that when we're when we discuss this, and and I think my advice as an individual is that we treat the fact that this says URL as if it said Fleen, right? The the fact that it is something you could pass to a URL parser and dereference is unrelated to its role here as a string match, a string exact match result, right? right. And so I, I think that what we want to say here is basically that this is string exact match. And the fact that it happens to be a URL is unrelated to the processing you do on it uh, to, to do that matching. So do not do any of the more complex URL matching that you might do uh, to say that these are semantically equivalent, like percent encoding um, uh, checks or, or any of that. If, if it is not string exact match, you failed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think. To, to some extent, the fact that we, we call it a URL parameter is, is a necessary evil, but I think that for this purpose, 
um, we, we should just pretend in our heads we called it fleeing. Yeah. And I, I, th I tried to get at that in the second paragraph I've quoted here, which says, if you got this in an ACME message, if you got this out of the directory or out of a location header, you must use that string to facilitate yeah. the string matching. Um, Although it sounds, can I try and paraphrase phrase what you said? Um, it sounds like what you're saying is that whatever you know chunk of code on the server this request lands at should consider itself to have a label, um, you know, that is you know, labels this chunk of code, um, and it's pro it's going to look like a URL because that's how HTTP request routing works, but it's basically just a label that the thing knows and is going to compare to this URL parameter. Right, but um, if, if you look at the, um, the URI matching uh, algorithms that are listed in 3986, it, it basically says there's a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, and one part of the hierarchy is to say um, whether or not it's an exact match that, that's doing here. <coughs> don't, don't look at any of that for this purpose, right? Um, what you really want to say is that for the purposes of, of gauging whether or not they match, we're going to say it's string exact match. Otherwise, we're going to fail. And there might be cases. Can you go back to that? Um, so there, there might be cases where um, if the server compares it and they don't match, they would have been semantically equivalent. Mm -hmm. But that's OK. Um, it, it's better, much better in this case to have a false negative of things that would have been semantically equal than to permit cases where a yes. false positive could creep in. So I. I really think just treat it as if it was an opaque label for the matching purpose is the right way to go. So let me throw one more nuance in here. So to do a string compare, you need two strings. Mm -hmm. um, one string is the thing that's in the URL header of the JR JWS. Um, what would you specify to be the other one? It's, isn't it the URL parameter, right? Well, that, that's one of them. But as you know, an HTTP request doesn't come with a full URL, typically. It comes with a host header, which may have a port attached, and a path that's up in the request URI, and a scheme that may or may not be derived from the transport. So you're, you're suggesting that uh, if it's canonicalized in one particular server in a way that's different from the way the parameter is, is written, um, that the canonicalization might be um, uh, might be generating something that causes the string exact match to fail because let's say the host header emitted by one particular user agent, it's always uppercase because they like that. Um, or, you know, the client and the server disagree on whether or not port 80 or port 443 is included in the, in the URL to be matched. Jeff, you had a comment? Um, so where you say request URI in, hi, Jeff Hodges. Uh, if, where you say request URI yeah. in the first paragraph, do you not mean effective request URI from the RFC 723X series? Yes. OK, that was not a phrase I was familiar with, so. Right, it, it got does. introduced in, in that series of specs. OK, great. But, but your question about is, is G, there, can you can you just offhand do an exact match between those two things because there might be case differences and such? I think that's still relevant. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. yeah. So Martin Thompson, I've actually, I've looked at this particular problem very very recently, and it's nasty. Um, yeah. So RFC 7230 has a section on URI normalization, and that talks about, it makes some recommendations about what you can do um, regarding percent encoding, uh, case, whether you, did you realize that you can put a host name, then a colon, and then a slash, and leave nothing there? The colon is, can be stupid, but that's how they, that's how they work. Um, and so it, it makes a number of recommendations, but it doesn't go all the way to recommending anything that's even close to interoperable yeah. in this context. However, you will find that in most cases here, you won't have a problem because the URLs are generated by the servers, is that right? And I think what you probably want to say is perform some simple transformations 
and as much as possible keep the the octets that the server sent you and then it'll probably work and in situations yeah. where it doesn't well you know back to debugging i guess uh and there'll be a lot of well don't do that then uh involved in this which is i know that sounds terrible but i don't know that there's any better advice that i can give at this point so so let me see if i i i can translate that uh, and make sure that what i heard and what you said agree yeah. um because the, the, the server generates the URL that's going to be used by the client to generate the request, Yes. Um, the client should use the generated URL in as an exact form as it is possible for the client to do in emitting the request back to the server. If there is composition required because of the host header to do that, um, it may chunk it but it should make no other change so that when the server gets it, um, reassembles it, the string exact match works. Yeah, and maybe the server can recover its, its process for generating the URL in the first place in order to make that process. Because what's gonna be happening here is that um, these URLs, I, I believe, appear in JSON that the server generates and sends down. So that right. there will be a, a UTF-8 encoding of these things that are present on the wire as the server will have originally conceived of them. So there are, there are a few techniques that we can use to sort of minimize the chance that this is gonna get screwed up. Uh, I would recommend that you um, that clients use the absolute form, but I know that we can't guarantee that because of the way that people use HTTP clients, um, stuff gets lost in translation, but. Um, well, remember the handling of this URL in the sense that matters here is at the JWS layer before it gets anywhere close to the HTTP layer. Right. Um, so if you recommend that the client uses the URL that it got from the server in JSON as, as, it, as it appeared in the JSON that it was provided and that you don't use the effective request URL um, in any of the JWS processing, I think you would sort of sidestep the the, the, the splitting up into the host header and the the um, the path component and all those sorts yeah. of other things. So essentially possible. we're saying this is supposed to be a round trip. Round trip, the, the bytes you got from the server into this, and yes. this will work. Yeah. If you do anything else, Lord help you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's yeah. the point. Yeah. I think, okay, so I think, I think what we can say here is um, every resource you might possibly send a post to is addressed with a URL that you've got from the server and you have to use that exact string mm -hmm. or all bets are off. Yeah. Or you, you must use that string. So basically take this latter paragraph and um, I think what we should do is elaborate the server side of that and say the server must do the same thing, must do the other side of that and the server must require that clients do this. Yeah, I, I don't know if you want to belt and braces on this one and, and go any further about making recommendations about how to construct that string. But I think I think what you want to do is there's there's going to be some information embedded in that URL that the server will have to recover. And you could possibly recommend that the server recover that information using whatever method it can and then reconstruct the string as it would have done when it sent it to the client. And hopefully that would produce the, the, the same output. As an example. Yeah. As an example, sure. yeah. All right, good. Good job of IETF solving minutia. Um, this, this is an important one. Okay, so the other major thing that I regret went in the last minute here and should have gone out for a little more discussion, but I wanted to put it out in a relatively concrete form for folks to look at, is this idea of applications. Um, so this application is the current word. I'm not super satisfied with it. It was also discussed under the name preconditions in uh, I think the last IETF and in some of the threads on the list. Um, but the idea here is to make the issuance process we have in Acme a little more flexible. So we wanted to support a little more variety in CA issuance flows. So there's some CA issuance flows right now where your own, the client is only told what it needs to do to get the certificate after it has already sent in its CSR to describe the certificate at once, um, which is not true in, in the current, in draft 02 ACME. In draft 02 ACME, there's an assumption that the client, if the client fills out the right authorizations, then he can just issue the certificate without any further 
question and answer. So this first case wouldn't be supported in the original ACME flow. Um, some CAs right now also require a reauthorization per issuance. So if you prove that you own example.com and you issue one certificate and you want a second certificate with example.com, they will require you to prove again that you own example.com. And so there is a desire for some scoping to authorizations here. Um, so there was also a desire that we discussed some last time. Uh, Phil raised the need for a cash box out of Acme. Um, and so there was a need to have some requirements for issuance other than authorization. Um, right now in the document, we have a requirements framework and it has two requirements, authorization and out of band, star, do, do whatever else here. Um, but the idea is, you know, in the original flavor of Acme, the draft 02 flavor, the only thing that you could do to satisfy the server that it should give you a certificate was prove that you own the relevant domains. There were no other conditions that the server could impose. And so, yeah, like I said, there's a lot of assumptions that Draft02 Acme made that were not, were you know, restricted it, uh, from addressing these use cases. Um, and I should say that the source for a lot of these use cases is kind of a, a loose survey I did starting from SSL mate and looking at a couple of other CA issuance APIs. But I think this, this is a pretty okay survey that covers a, a broad swath of, of current practice. So I'd be glad if there's other CAs in the room to tell me that I'm foolish full of it and um, these are not actual requirements and we should uh, just revert everything, make it a lot simpler. Um, but I, I get the sense that this is, at least the, the cash box one is gonna be a hard requirement here. So the idea here, um, let's see, next slide I think. Um, yeah, so as we discussed them on the list, um, the big change here is in, the, in Draft02, what the client does is it shows up, it registers, it does a bunch of authorizations, proves it owns a bunch of domains, and then it sends in a CSR and gets a certificate. And what we've done in this is we've just swapped those latter two steps. So first, the client sends in the CSR and says, here is the certificate I would like to get. And then the server responds to that and says, here's what you have to do to get that certificate. And that's, like I said, there's two things it can require in the spec right now. It can say, you have to fulfill these authorizations, you have to prove you own these domains, and there's an out-of-band uh, requirement. It can say you have to go to this website and follow whatever the instructions are there. Um, so, and then once you've done this, um, you know, once you've satisfied this, the CA goes ahead and issues a certificate. Um, next slide, I've got some pretty pictures. So yeah, this is, this is the old flow. So client shows up, makes a registration, does another post to, to, to create a new authorization uh, for whatever the domain is he wants to, are you just looking? Okay. Um, these are also on the materials page if you want to have them close up on your laptop. Um, this is just my kind of cartoon of how the process works. So the client says, I would like authorization for example.com. The server creates a challenge to say, here's how you can prove example.com. The client sets everything up and says, okay, I'm ready. Um, green, I'm representing uh, gray on the left. I'm representing these pending states. So the server issued it, but it doesn't know uh, if it's valid or not. Once the client responds to the challenge, the, client, the server goes off and validates it, which is not shown here. But once it's validated, it turns the, the challenge green. It says the challenge is good. Notify, you know, at that point, once this, the, uh, the challenge has been completed, the authorization is good. Uh, the client polls to see when that happens. And then once the authorization is good, the client can send a new, new certificate request. This should look pretty familiar if you, you know the old spec. This is just kind of a graph so we can compare with the new stuff. Any questions about this? Clarifications? Isn't that get backwards? Well, yeah, the, the, it's intended to illustrate information flow as opposed to request response flow. But yeah. Uh, next slide, please. So here is the flow we have in the current draft. Um, so you can see there is another layer compared to the last one. Um, that's just a slide layout. But, the idea here is you, you show up, you register, and then you instead of sending a new authorization request, you send in an application for a certificate. That was the, the, the word I picked out of the ether, not totally satisfied. If, if you have a better word, I'd love to hear it. But the app, what the application says is it's basically the same thing that was in the new certificate message before. It's a CSR and the not before and not after dates I would like. It's an application for a certificate. Go ahead, Ecker. So say I have a system where I have a separation between the origin servers, which are um, 
getting the certificates and the authorization system, which is approving them. And now in, in, in the current design, as I understand it, that means I need to make a dummy CSR, which I actually wish not to be fulfilled in order to determine the conditions for, in order to in, determine the conditions. So I can't stand up purely my authorization, my authorization system without standing up one of the instances of the things which actually will be, will be, will be the sort of identities, correct? That is correct. In this system, you cannot obtain authorization without also obtaining a certificate. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I think I, it's lame. I think I just said so, which is that it means I cannot build a separated system without having a dummy CSR that I wish not to be authorized. So I know I've got, I know I've got, I've got a thousand a thousand domain names I want I want, I want I've got a thousand domain names that I wish to be able to issue certificates for, and then I'm going to spin up a variety of web servers which will then go request those certificates or not, and I'm going to authorize them. Now those all have to be spun up before I can do anything. Thompson. So I'm I'm wondering, does is the is the authorization strictly um, subject to the application? Is it is it um, enti entirely owned by, or will they exist independent of? So in the current spec, it's uh, there is an option for the CA to scope the authorization to the to, to the registration to scope the authorization to the application. Right. Because um, so, I think I think Eka's concern might be addressed by using the dummy CSR in, in that case, and you know you can throw away the private key. No, I, I want it not. That, that's just stupid. I don't want it to be. I don't want a CSR. I mean, so uh -huh. like you could monkey patch this by just having a flag in the request that says, "I'm just doing this to see the requirements. Don't actually issue the certificate." No, he wants but, he wants the authorization authorization to be fulfilled and and oh, yeah, be yeah. usable for the the later thing. The question is, can you reuse the authorization for something else? I mean, I mean, and, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, well, and that's ultimately going to be up to the CA's policy. Of course, of course. Right? No, again, my question so, is not so, so the point is like this. My point, my point, is, authorization my point is, is the only working, useless in a case where the authorizations are only good. For I understand, but my point is the only actual working ACME CA does not have the policy you're suggesting. And so it is extraordinarily silly to design the system. I understand, I understand what you're saying is let's design for the most restrictive policy, but that restrictive policy imposes annoying conditions on the on, on the on the customer. Um, so, so we, there was a, a brief exchange on the list about should we keep around new authorization? Because you could design it, you could design a flow where, like, in if you author if you offer a new authorization endpoint in the directory, that's a CA's way of saying I support generic authorizations. You can come here and pre-authorize, and we can do the traditional the the. the the Acme dance you know and love, mm -hmm. and then you can come along and do this application thing and all the things will just pop in there and you'll be good to go. You won't have to do any more authorizations. Um, feedback on the list at that point was, if we're gonna do this, let's go ahead and kill a new authorization. But if you think this is an important use case. I just think it's unfortunate. Um, and it seems to me that like, um, the, you know, that the operating conditions that I, that, that, that I, that I use for my the, the operating conditions that I use for the keys that I actually do terminate, that I actually, that actually um, you know, wish to wish to certify for maybe totally different from that key from the keys that I wish to that, that I wish to be authorizing. Let me give you a concrete example. Say that say that what I wish to do is um, I wish to issue um, ED two five five one certificates with ED two five five one nine in the terminal identity, or even more aggressively, say I wish to issue a Diffie Hellman certificate with X two five five one nine in the terminal identity. Right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going so now and but on their hand that's like in my web server somewhere. And my box, uh, my box that is a registration has like never heard of X25519. And it's doing P256. So now what I have to do is I'm gonna make a fake certificate which contains some sort of some sort of lame key which can is of no use to anybody, and which I wish not to be that valid. So, so this part I don't think is is actually all that meaningful because okay. either way, like whichever order you wish to send the CSR in, like the the cert management box has to get a CSR from the box that has the real key at some point. You're just saying it has to do it up front instead of when you. Yeah, but I, I understand. Oh, I see, but I see my, my, my point, my point is that my, my, my point is you say, oh, it doesn't matter. Why not just get a dummy certificate and not worry about it? And what I'm saying is, what, what I'm saying is that there may be conditions where the series have completely different characteristics than what they eventually wish to issue because my, my systems are not yeah. compatible. 
Um, so yeah, I do. Th I do think it's. A, I do think that like that this is like not an opportune time to like take out something which is like a basic use case. Um, um, uh, for, for what strikes me is basically, uh, basically basically an aesthetic argument about about about, about keeping everything in one flow. Is, is, so is it going to let, that much? L let me ask the question that was asked before, which I didn't hear you answer, which is. If the new applications flow is restored so that both this new flow and the original flow are supported, do you have a problem? And if so, what is that problem? I think that'd be fine. Okay. Mark? I, it wouldn't be the original flow. It would still have an application in order to get it to yeah. a certificate. It's just yes. that so, all so, the authorizations would But it would, it would restore new applications in order to get the ordering that he... he it, would, it would restore new authorization. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So... Uh, uh, in in the room, we'll clearly have to take this to the list for for uh, uh, confirmation. But in the room, is there anybody who objects to having both flows supported? And if so, could you come to the microphone and tell us why? Okay, so we'll take the question to the list to, to confirm that restoring the or uh, having both flows supported isn't an issue for anybody else, but. Uh, for the moment, let's write that down as the tentative resolution and uh, move on. Yeah, I think that that makes sense. Um, and I think I would probably add that since we have this scoping requirement around now, I would probably require that authorizations created through that magazine be unscoped because what would you scope them to? Um, but that makes sense. All right, so that's that's the overview of the applications mechanism. I think the next slide just has a couple of little considerations. Um, um, smaller than one echo raised. Um, yeah, this looks mostly the same from the client and server point of view. Server has to do a little bit more state tracking, but it's um, pretty minor. Um, but like, a, like the last bullet says, this is very much a first cut, um, very open to suggestions, comments. Um, yeah, there's, and I've highlighted some in the spec, there's some in the next section. All right, so I think that's it for current spec. Any other, Notes people have thoughts on the, what's what went in in 03. Again, uh, apologize for the late rush at the deadline. I uh, hope the two weeks between then and now have been useful to folks to, to catch up on what's in the spec. All right, so we have some issues in the issue tracker and some in the doc. Uh, wanted to call these out and see if folks have any thoughts. So one thing someone had asked for is uh, some explicit indication of the Acme version in the protocol. So right now we don't have that. Um, there's no place in the protocol where the server says, this is the Acme version I support, or the client says, this is the version I support. Um, the issue, uh, the guy who filed the issue said that uh, you could put this in the directory, in the meta container we have where the server can state metadata about its Acme service. Um, in thinking about this a little bit, though, it occurs to me there might be some subtleties here given the kind of decoupled way this thing is designed. So you might have a registration, an account you created with a V1 with the CA via the V1 protocol. And maybe the server is upgraded to V2 and has is willing to persist those registrations. And so there's some V1 stuff that persists into V2. Um, maybe this isn't an issue. It just sort of seemed like there might be some subtlety here. Um, anyone have preferences on stating versions? Right now you can state it by um, you know, using different URLs per version as is commonly done with web APIs. Um, so maybe there's not a need here at all. Phil. I totally want the version to be in band because that's the only way it can be authenticated. Uh, if, if, since we're going to be doing this stuff, uh, yes, you're doing it over HTTP today, but you know we might want to do it over different protocols. HTTP is probably not going to be around forever. Um, I certainly don't want to have you know, the fewer connections that there are to the Acme stuff to what it's riding on, the better. Okay. So yes, always put the v version number in band. It's just not a close call. So Phil, do you think that we should then put the creative version number and put it inside of the authenticated envelope? Yeah. Interesting proposal. Yeah, um, Martin Thompson, the, the thing that worries me in that regard, and I think Phil's comment sort of highlights that, is if we make changes to the protocol, that have subtle implications on the semantics of various fields that are under protection. We have this problem where things that were signed in one context can be used Related in another context, another. and we have to think about 
the way that they interact with each other in nasty ways. And if there's an explicit version, it can just be a string saying, this is acne, right? Um, then we're done, right? You just check that it's the same. If it's not the same, buff. Very simple thing. And I, I think this is a reasonable, reasonable thing. And the key here is we have to think about it. I much prefer things that we don't have to think about. And we put this thing in now, we don't end up having a three year, how do we do move to version next? So uh, Martin Thompson again, that the, um, the thing that we're doing in, in TLS 1.3 is we're prefix, prefixing everything that we sign with TLS 1.3 and some other information typically. Um, yeah. This basically does the same thing because we're, we're using um, JWS yeah. and you just have to include it somewhere. So that would address the post bodies sent by the client, but not anything sent by the server. Unless we were to add a field to all of the server responses that says this is the version. And then it would be authenticated by HTTPS. Yeah, I suspect that this is probably okay because the, the, the general model that we're operating on is that the client authenticates its its information by using WS and signing things. And the server authenticates its its responses by putting them in HTTPS. Yeah. So it, do you think we should also have a ser <laughs> server sent version number? Why not? Or is just to go the same, just make it, make it completely symmetric to say every single, um, every single object that we generate. You used to have a type on everything, right? I don't think it was on everything, but sure. Yeah, there so, was a, the, there was a- yeah, Challenges all have a type, challenge. requirements all have a type. Yeah, but then we, that we was moved for to stuff. just including the URI because that was yeah. considered more precise. But now there's this idea that, well, it's just a URI, what does it actually mean? It doesn't carry any, I, I can't check that now. So I think that, yeah, you might as well. Well, that, that's still focused on the client to server end. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, maybe we can take through the list to figure yeah, out exactly what the semantics kick, are. Kick it around a little bit, but yeah. I think there's something there. Yeah, so it sounds like client to server, the thing to have is a, a new thing in the JWS protected header. Um, is it, That's your version. Um, and then maybe something in the server side. Dan. Uh, Dan. Daniel Khan Gilmore. So, um, I just wanted to point out that this doesn't mean we don't have to think about it at all, right? We, the, the, and we don't get upgrades for free yep. right, just by having the version number indicated, right? If we have the version number, what we're doing basically is saying, as soon as we change the version number, all of the old clients are going to fail explicitly. Yeah. Yes. So yes. just... This is, this is why I was yeah. concerned about wanting to bring some old clients along. But ultimately, I think maybe Fast failure might be better. Is yeah. that what Thompson's so, about to say? So, so Martin Thompson, we can decide not to change the version number and add things. Oh yeah, sure. Right. So there is that option, but then we we'd have to think about it. <laughs> yeah, there, there is no escaping thinking about it. Let's just. I think we all agree there's no escaping thinking. Really? Yeah, I guess that's what we're paid to do. <laughs> Remind me to stop using TLS. All right, I think, I think we're good on that. Um, so right now, this one's also pretty simple. Um, if you create a registration with one account key and then you try and create, a, you send an, another new registration account with the same account key, there's a requirement that the server return a 409 conflict response along with a pointer to the existing one. So the, the, the filer of the issue pointed out that this is way too harsh. It's not, it doesn't need to be an error. You should just return success and say you've, you've found the one that uh, is is the real thing um, and provide the, the URL there. Martin, it looks like you're having some feeling here. Maybe a, a 300 response would be more semantically clear. Yeah. Is that? Oh, um, Thompson suggests 302 found, which seems all right to me. Um, it might be slightly non-trivial for clients that are just transparently handling, you know, where the HTTP layer transparently handles redirects. Um, you might not get the the URL out easily, but I think we can find some ways to to hack around that. 
So, so Martin Thompson, they, you are um, returning a 201 in the case where you, you've created a new resource, right? Right. So the two, and you, it includes yeah, a location yeah. header. Exactly. And the 302 will have a location header with the same information in it. If you just ignore what the status code is, you get the same result. Uh, in principle, but I think in practice, some HTTP libraries treat 300 series from differently from 200, right? Uh, not usually automatically. Okay. Mm, yeah, I think that's right. XHR might do, but. Yeah. Well, I think you could solve it anyway by having whatever the final response is also include the location header. Is that too suspect, Mr. HTTP? Okay. All right, we can hack around this somehow. Okay, so um, let the minutes reflect 302. Um, maybe we can crash the note server by sending it into some redirect loop. <laughs> All right, um, okay, this is another kind of simple to conceptualize one. Right now we have two out of band things, and the question is should we have one? Um, we have an out of band requirement in the application flow where the server can say, it, before I will issue the certificate at all, you have to go do this thing, like the payment thing. Um, and it's just a URL, you go to a website and do whatever it says there. We also have a similar thing at the challenge level, which was added, I think, in the last IETF cycle, uh, which says, you know, instead of doing one of the predefined challenges like HTTP or DNS or TLSSNI, you have to do this other thing before I will consider you authorized for this identifier. So the difference here is just in what the out of band thing is gating, whether it's gating authorization, or whether it's getting issuance of the certificate overall. Um, question is, should we kill one of these and just have one out of band thing? Uh, the argument for dropping one is sort of, why have two out of band? Do we need them both? The argument for keeping them would be that, you know, you could imagine a CA that um, you know, migrated most of its flow over to Acme and just couldn't migrate its validation system. Um, you know, it, it would like to use all of Acme's state tracking and, uh, and issuance flow in that, but it can't, you know, it needs some, you know, specially crafted email based or, you know, phase of the moon based domain validation. Uh, and it needs to use the out of bound stuff for that. Um, anyone have strong preferences here? Not seeing a lot of action here. So I think my suggestion would be I kind of have sympathy with the only do one out of band thing here. So unless there's objections, I think I don't think we can get rid of the requirement one because that's Phil's cash box. But I think we can get rid of the challenge one um, because that's at a finer level of granularity. So I think unless there's objections, I think I'll go ahead with taking out the out of band challenge. Are there objections? Please come to the mic now if you're in the room. Right, we'll confirm on the list, but it looks like yeah. there are no objections in the room. So Martin Thompson, just on, on the last one, I did some checking. It is possible to suppress the following of redirects on fetch. In, in fetch, okay. Yeah, I don't know about XHR because I, we've, we've orphaned <laughs> that one now. Yeah. The other thing I would observe here is that if it turns out in some future scenario we need the out of band challenge thing, the challenge space is designed to be extensible, so it's trivial to add it back. We don't need to bump the version number, we can just add it back in. All right, so resolved, uh, pending list confirmation. All right, this one is slightly more technical, and it goes back to that question we were discussing earlier about how do you roll from one account key to another? Um, we, this is like iteration number three or four of the signing structures. So we did one that Karthik didn't quite like. Uh, we swapped the order of signatures in that, uh, and then Jacob came along and, and came along came up with this parallel signature thing that we we fixed with having both the new key and the old key. So right now, um, the structure you sign to change from an old key to a new key is you create this message that has both keys in it, both public keys, and then you sign with both private keys, um, so that both keys uh, agree to the changeover. Um, that, that was sort of the critical property that, um, that we need to get out of this, this message, um, is the ascent of both keys to the handover. Um, the <coughs> issue in practice with this parallel signature thing is that it requires a multi-signature JWS, which a lot of library, JWS libraries that are out there don't support. And if you're doing a, uh, I was doing some implementation works after publishing drafts, if you, uh, um, 
you could imagine building a nice transport layer for your Acme server where it validates one signature per post um, and reports up what key it did that validation with to the Acme layer. Um, this breaks that pattern of every post being signed by a single key and you know, has multiple keys. And so it's a little bit awkward um, from that design architecture aesthetic point of view. Um, so the proposal here is just to serialize the signatures or to make the signatures go in sequence instead of in parallel. I'm having a flashback to the last time we tried to count on a signature having a certain technical property. Um, have you had somebody verify that this is not depending on unauthorized properties of SIGOL? Uh, yeah, this, so I think this was actually where we ended up with Karthik on the last go round. Um, and then we, um, we went to the parallelized thing after Karthik said that would sort of be okay. Okay. I mean, yeah. it's clear. I mean, I guess my point is, it's not clear to me that SIGNU is a signature on M. Oh, okay, yeah. This, that was, I, yeah, I wrote that in clearly. So what I mean is um, that that should read sig, uh, that you would send. Uh, Wait, is the inner, is the inner break, is the, that? The, the, the inner, the inner M comma sigold. M comma sigold. Okay. Yeah, okay. Oh. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. yeah, so so the the proposed version is written wrong because I did it while jet lagged this morning. Um, the the inner the inner signed content that is signed by the new key is M comma sig old M. Right. So the both keys end up signing over the content. Just make sure they're unambiguous. Yeah. But what what do you mean by unambiguous? <laughs> what I mean. What, what I mean is that I don't want there to be confusion about which part of the message you're signing is the signature and which part is the message. Oh, sure. Okay. So no, I think the. If they're merely concatenated, we're yeah. back to like, oh, is there, what's the length of these things? And, yeah, no, no, no. The, the, yeah. yeah the, way, the way we did this in, the last, in a couple of iterations ago was you just create a whole JWS object that you know, has the, the payload and all that. And then you wrap it in another JWS object. So like it's a little bloaty, which is part of what Jacob didn't like when he did the parallelization. But it's in some ways conceptually simpler. Uh, Ted, Ted Hardy, and I'm, I'm having a moment here that, that's making me feel like I'm missing something. And it may be just because I'm missing the M comma sig old M here. Yeah. But I would have thought that it would have worked better to have sig old sign M comma uh, sig new M, um, but the the thinking that somebody who could extract the the part of the object that's M and sig old M could then sign it with some other sig new, mm -hmm. um, and and therefore be uh, asserting it based on an extracted signature of sig old over m. Yeah, re recall, however, that m includes both oh, the right. key and the new yeah. key. Yeah. So uh, yeah. both so, keys okay. are signing over both keys. Can can I ask us to break away from this and look at the real struct? Can you, do you have the real struct somewhere? The current struct? Yeah. Uh, so it's the, that'll be the parallel. Um, yeah, pull, pull up this back. Um, um, okay. Uh, you... Actually, just send to the list the actual struct when yeah. you, okay. when we when we take this and I, I think that will help. Yeah, we'll do all of us visually. Yeah, uh, Phil Hanbecker here. Yeah, I, I'm kind of confused. There is only going to be one copy of the blob that is signed. I hope, because that. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Not Just. What you said. Yeah, because that's not what you said. Yeah. No, uh, there is. There is only. Yeah, because so, the, the, the the thing about the wrapping. I mean, like, I I think the problem we have here is we have a, no, a notation that isn't J JSON, yeah. and to discuss this particular point, we need to see the JSON to understand what the hell's going on. Totally agree. Um, I apologize, jet lag. Um, no, the, the, the idea is that you will have a JWS whose payload is the message. The signing key for that JWS will be the old key. And then that whole JWS will be serialized a64 encoded and become the payload of another JWS whose signing key is the new key. So there's one copy of the message being signed, which is inside all of that layer of wrapping, inside the, pay the 
inside the inner JWS, which is the payload of the outer JWS. Like I said, it is kind of bloaty. There's a bunch of base 64 encoding here, but let me let me send the the, the concrete stuff to the list. Yeah, just I just wanted to give a this is a sort of a data point. I'm sorry, Brian Campbell. Uh, on you mentioned a lot of the Jose libraries only support a single signature model of of JWS, which is true. I happen to have one of those libraries, but I got a an issue filed on the asking about how to do exactly what you were proposing in the most recent one. I, I do want to say that it is almost trivial to support the multiple signature model as long as the you don't make use of like the unprotected headers to hold the algorithm or anything mm -hmm. kind of funny like that. The way you've yeah. done it now, I don't think the limitation on library support for it is particularly a big concern because you can take libraries like mine that don't support the, the mm -hmm. and it's like a few lines to just kind of mix and match and put it in there. So. For whatever it's worth, I, point. I don't have a sort of dog in the fight, but I don't think it's a major like stumbling block. Yeah. Okay. Fair point. Yeah, I still like kind of the architectural point a little bit better, but it sounds like there's no huge concerns raised here, so this will probably end up being a discussion between Jacob and myself because we're kind of on opposite sides of this. Um, so we'll hash it out and get the proposals to the list um, uh, for more concrete feedback. And again, apologies for the really confusing notation here. Next. Um, does anyone care about nonces? Anyone feeling overwhelmed with nonces? Um, <laughs> the Let's Encrypt guys uh, posted uh, a suggestion that um, we try and be a little more economical with the replay nonces we provide. So right now, the server is required to provide a fresh replay nonce that the, the client can use in a post request on every successful response, be that a get response, a post response, a head response, you know, whatever response you send that succeeds. Um, has to have a replay nonce header in it. Makes it really easy for a client to get a nonce when it needs to send a post request. Um, in the clients I've written, you just send a head request to the same resource, get a nonce, and then do a post request. Um, the concern the Let's Encrypt guys raised was that this causes the server to have to keep a bunch of nonces, uh, you know, keep state about a bunch of nonces that may be outstanding, and most of which will never get used because they were in response to something, uh, some get request, and the, client wasn't even looking for a replay nonce. Uh, so they suggested that to restrict the requirement to only requiring the server to provide nonces in post responses. And then you know, if you provide them in response to post responses, that means you can sort of do a chain of post responses. You do a request, you get a nonce in the, in the response that you can use for the next request and so on. So you can have a conversation that way, but then you need some sort of way to, to kick the whole thing off. So you need some resource that you can not send a post to uh, that will give you a, or you can send a request other than a post to, that will give you a nonce to kick off the whole process. Um, I am stating the arguments uh, for completeness, but I really think this is not really an issue. Um, if you look at, there are ways to maintain lots of nonces um, without, uh, well, you know, that scale proportion, in proportion to the number of nonces that are used, not the number of nonces that are issued. Um, so I'm inclined to let this one drop unless um, someone feels strongly about this. There might be more discussion on the list, but I'm not seeing anyone in the room leaping to the mic on this. By, by drop, you mean just close the issue? Just close the issue and leave the requirement as it is, yeah. So Martin Thompson, I, I, I know that I've just been discussing replay of post requests um, in the last session. I wonder if we, could send the same nonce on every request and not actually check them, and it would still work. Um, you, you will mean, end up with you, extra you authorizations. If the, if the server could send the same nonce? Yeah, I mean, it, to, to sort of comply with the spec and allow clients to do whatever they want, but but ultimately not actually worry about this because this, the, what are the consequences of replay in this situation? That's almost as bad as the other suggestion that was made on the list, which was just dropping the replay nonce altogether. Well, that's effectively what I'm suggesting. Yeah. Um, um, why is that bad? Um, sort of for the same reason we have the URL thing um, to protect from CDN's replaying requests. Um, for example, a new cert request you could replay and, you know, get a new, a new cert with the same parameters. Because um, there's no time in that? 
there is not currently a notion of time. It's all non-spaced. Right. And so uh, the new cert request could happen at any time. Yeah. You can, you know, wait and you know, any time throughout the length of the authorization. Okay. I mean, that may not be a big deal because, you know, the, the attacker in this case might not have the private key, but maybe he does. So I, I'm inclined to keep, I, I am disinclined to drop the replay protection. Yeah. Let's all wait for Ecker. <laughs> yeah, um, I wouldn't drop the replay protection, but this strikes me as a false economy. Meaning the, the proposal does. Yes. So you would, I, I mean, like any operational server is like probably records about four kilobytes of data for every single HTTP request it receives. So like the having 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 to having to also store 120 bits or so of nonce for some short period of time does not strike me as a particularly onerous obligation. Yeah. Okay. Sounding like there's some agreement with the the proposal. To leave the requirement as it is. Um, next slide. Yeah, okay, so after having drafted this, the applications flow, which we will re-add the new authorization flow to, as um, Ecker pointed out the need, um, there were some questions that arised and some things you could do with this new application flow that are not in the spec right now. So if you look at the SSL made API, which has a similar sort of request a certificate, uh, you know, apply for a certificate, get requirements flow, um, that API requires the client to send another request to actually issue the certificate. So once all the requirements have been met, the client has to say, yes, I want this certificate, go ahead and issue it. Um, so I dropped an open issue in the, um, in the doc as to whether we should have that extra step there require basically a confirmation from the client that you should go ahead, that the server should issue the certificate. Um, I note that this morning, um, Andrew Ayer, the SSL made author, said, no, we should not do this. Um, you know, given his operational experience, it was not worth the extra step. Um, any, anyone in the room have feedback on that question? It seems simpler just to leave it as it is. I guess I'll leave it that way until someone complains. Um, the other thing you can do is um, consider making these requests modifiable or supporting multiple CSRs. So maybe a, a CA will um, you know, allow a single order to issue um, both RSA, oh, issue certificates for both RSA and ECDSA keys for the same subject. Um, and so you could send in two CSRs at once um, and have the uh, request end up issuing multiple certificates. Um, Ted, you're furrowing your brow here. While he's walking, I'll say the other use case to this is renewal. So you might want to enable a client to say, change the dates on this, uh, on the uh, on the application, change it not before, not after, and cause that to reissue a certificate with new dates, assuming all the requirements are still satisfied. Ted. Uh, Ted Hardy from the floor microphone for those in the uh, uh, ether. Uh, I, I was just trying to uh, imagine how much savings there was really going to be in not having each of the multiple CSRs um, be in an, in a separate application, because that, that seems to be the obvious option here. Um, and I was wondering if you had any, I mean, what are we actually saving by not having them be in their independent applications? Yeah, so from chatting with Andrew, I, I understand that there are some CA cases right now where where you're paying for the, the order. And if you get them both together, you they're considered as one order and one transaction, and you pay once for both of those certificates. Um, I don't know if that's something we need to reflect at this layer of the protocol. I don't think so. I, okay. uh, so personally speaking, I, I would say that putting that okay. into the state mechanics doesn't seem sensible. If they want to do that, they can have an order ID um, where if you're all associated with the same order ID, the order ID means that right. you pay your transaction fee just once if you use this this <laughs> handy code. Um, maybe they could reuse the nonce for that. No, I, I, I didn't mean that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not a huge fan. Um, how about renewal while you're up? Any thoughts on that? I don't have thoughts on renewal. Okay. Problem. Oh, Richard, yeah. Um, so relaying for Andrew Ayer. Uh, he says the reason why SSL mate needs the extra step is because our API doesn't have challenges. 
Acme oh. does, so it's redundant. Excellent. Nice, clear answer. Okay, so we will, I will delete that open issue from the spec, consider it closed. And it's sounding like I'm not hearing, I, I think um, the issue of modifiables and multipl multiples, um, I noticed Andrew posted some feedback to the list this morning and I haven't had any time to look at that. So there may be, I think he's had some thoughts on, he did have some thoughts on renewal, Ted. Um, so uh, I will consider that remaining open for now. Um, recovery, um, to move on down here. So we, at the original draft of, of ACME, all the way back at the individual submission stage, had not one but two mechanisms by which an account holder who had lost his account key could recover his account and gain control of it again. Um, Contact-based recovery, you know, send me an email sort of recovery, and a Mac-based recovery scheme where you used uh, a short code that you've been provided by the CA. Um, both of those have since been removed from the spec. Um, I think I've still got some notes in my to-do list to, to think about doing this. There was some discussion. Um, Karthik's analysis pointed to some recovery mechanisms that would be that would be workable, that would be good to have. And so there was some thought about you know outlining a recovery mechanism in here that you could instantiate in a few ways, but not actually providing a concrete instantiation. Um, benefit would be that you know we would capture the for posterity this framework that we'd agreed was cryptographically sound. Uh, if only you had a way to provision the right bits. Um, and so save the risk of getting it wrong. In principle, reduce the risk of getting it wrong later. Um, but it wouldn't really provide much utility in the short term. So I guess the proposal here is to kind of declare recovery well and truly dead. Um, does anyone think that losing your account key is something we really need to worry about, I guess, is, is this? Yeah. Um, yeah, a recovery mechanism in ACME. I mean, it's clearly the case of an actual operational CNA is some way to deal with this. Well, yes. <laughs> um, well, not necessarily. I mean, like if you're, if the only requirement is that you show up and you validate your domains, like you, in principle, you could just generate a new key pair, validate all your domains, and yeah, it's a bit of a headache, but you haven't lost anything really huge. Um, I mean, I think we discussed this when we first, when Let's Go first started, right? And one of the explicit concerns was that, um, was that it would not be possible to reissue for domains which had already been issued for without extreme measures. And so merely showing up with a new account key and validating your domains makes it hard to discriminate between the situation where I've decided to take over all your accounts and the situation where you actually lost your account key. So now maybe that maybe you need maybe an out of scope mechanism is sufficient for setting that for for setting that and you don't need to recover the the key. Yeah. Um, but I do not think it is the case that you do not need to be able to have a situation in which people lose their keys and discriminate from that situation in which I'm trying to take over your accounts. Okay. So do I mean But I think I think it'd be fun. I think that one way to handle that would be to say that the recovery mechanisms were inherently basically manual and that the way a CA handles this is by um is is by basically having a manual process which resets you back to the state as if the as if these domains had ever been registered and then allows you to do it again. And that, and, and the advantage of that would be that that does not introduce new, new, um, you know, Comsec um, logic errors in the in the system. Otherwise, because the worst case scenario is that you're back to ground zero, as opposed to that you've re recovered the account key. So I think that'd be fine. But I think the I think, I think something should be said here. Okay. Um, I mean, maybe you can get away with this back. I mean, like. I mean, I guess my point is, is the first question you want to ask is, what if I lose the account key? And yeah. so your answer is going to be, this is out of scope for the protocol? Uh, that, that's the question on the table. So I, I think- like, I Is this something I, we, we, we say CAs have to solve on their own, however they do it? I guess I would say, I would suggest some guidance would be appropriate. Okay. But I think the, guide, and the guidance, I think guidance would be fine to say that, in, that, that CAs should probably have some manual process um, of some kind for dealing with account key recovery, and we recommend that they basically just put the account rather than trying to recover the key. Yeah. So Martin Thompson, I mean, part of the the additional extra steps that you might do is have different challenges in response to, or more challenges in response to the, the request to create authorizations for which an existing account already has, or an existing registration already has authorization. I mean, that could be a policy choice that the, that the CA could make. Yeah, that's definitely a CA policy yeah. choice. 
Uh, Russ Housley. So what I think you're saying is that the CA still remembers the public key, but for whatever reason, the client can't remember or is, can't, doesn't, is, doesn't, I forgot, my, I forgot my password, the private yeah. key or the key to recover it from whatever file he has. Right. So I think a section on operational considerations that says you need a way to create a replacement um, account key as opposed to doing any kind of recovery because uh, that encourages one to store it in some other place like in the cloud or whatever. Yeah. Well, so let me, oh, go ahead. I, I was going to ask uh, Russ at the mic whether he would be willing to draft some text as a uh, uh, initial take on this to provide to the working group. Sure. So just for context here, um, the recovery mechanism we'd sketched out with Karthik was basically the rollover mechanism here, except, except you would that roll you can't over. sign with the old. Well, you can roll over not from the old key to the new key, but you can roll over from a Mac key to a new key if you've provisioned. But then, what Mac if you don't know where that is? I mean, that 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 leads to the same yeah. situation as the revoke uh, your certificate if I signing a revocation request with your revocation key and right right so it's just what key did i lose that i can't do what you expected me to do yeah yeah so i think becker is probably about right by providing uh, and russ about providing operational considerations and kind of resetting things so so russ was was the answer to ted's question you'll craft some text for us okay great <laughs> fantastic all right um yeah, and the only last question here was we have uh, the, the way we do scoping in, the, in draft 03 is the authorization struct has a scope field in it, which is either not present or it is the URL for an application to which this authorization belongs. Um, pretty rudimentary scoping, but I think it covers at least some use cases and the question is if there's a need for more. This is probably not a really useful to discuss right now, but just to throw a flag in case people have use cases that need more different scoping or something else. All right, I think that's all I've got for open issues. Um, yeah, so last call, it's a thing. Next slide. For those who might not be, uh, might not have the IETF process swapped in, um, this is my cartoon of the Ooh. process. Um, <laughs> where, um, not you know, scale? Not, you know, no, not to scale. <laughs> We're roughly scaled. <laughs> right, so this idea is... Um, well, it really, it should be kind of kind of spiky, um, you know, where work, work, occur, work occurs at IETF deadlines uh, during the actual work phase. Um, so, yeah, the idea is, you know, we do, we've done a bunch of work on this, refining it, and then there's a bunch of last calls for comments and, and ballots that go out before it gets to be an RFC. But the idea is once we send it off on that path, we should feel pretty comfortable that all the major issues have been addressed. Um, so the question is, do we at least have a list of the major issues that we need to address um, as we prepare to send this off in the, uh, sometime in the fall? So on the next slide. So we had a few things left over from the previous section, some action items for, for the authors to resolve. Um, this is kind of a, a, when I was a working group chair, I used the second to last call for comments. Um, <laughs> it's a call for issues, anything that you think is ambiguous or uh, not covered by the current spec. Um, so I think it would be good to have a list of issues pretty soon now. Um, people could flush those issues out to the list kind of as soon as possible. Um, and then we can work on getting those addressed in the next few weeks. Um, I mean, it would also be good to have at least a couple of implementations of the latest spec. I've talked to the Let's Encrypt guys. They're going to start working on upgrading their server pretty soon now. Um, if you go to the next slide, the rough timeline I've got, in my mind at least, talking with the other <laughs> authors, is getting together with the feedback from this meeting uh, and the issue list and kind of hammering out a bunch of the stuff we, the, that we know is outstanding right now and turning that into another uh, working group draft, which we'll consider sort of an implementation target um, so that the Let's Encrypt guys will start implementing, hopefully some other folks who are out there who have clients or servers will start implementing as well. 
and we can get some experience with uh, whatever the latest this implementation draft is. I guess it would be probably zero four. Um, so I think the hope would be produce that sometime mid next month. Um, I have more confidence in that than I did the last time estimate I gave at the last IETF meeting. Um, and then we could look at implementation through September, maybe have a virtual interim to address any issues that come up as we do implementation, um, and aim for a working group last call in October. So note that the next meeting for the IETF that's a face-to-face -face meeting um, is in November 13th through 18th, and it is the intention of this group um, that this should go up to the IESG before that meeting. And so we, we consider that the, the goal. Um, so this, this timeline is to accomplish that. Everybody understand and okay with the timeline? Of course, we could be faster than this if people are interested in being faster. And trust me, we, we would be very happy of that. Really, it's all gated on Russ at this point. <laughs> <laughs> It's a really important paragraph. Don't lose the key. Yeah. All right. So yeah, well, um, I'll get together with the other authors um, after the IETF meeting and see if we can get this hammered out um, and get some implementation going. Okay. So I think that is the end of my slides. Oh, right. I had one more thing. Um, so speaking of implementation, uh, after getting draft 03 out, I thought, gee, wouldn't it be great to actually have an implementation of the current spec going? So I started one up. Uh, next slide. Reviving some old code, um, Joe Hildebrand and I had started work on a Node.js implementation of Acme. Um, so I've kind of revived that under the branding of uh, Rocket Skates, you know, Acme. Uh, it's designed to be light and fast. Um, the idea here is to have kind of a pedagogical uh, client and server stack, so to demonstrate what the, layer, the architecture is of the protocol, help people understand the protocol, help people do testing of their uh, other implementations, and maybe provide some test suites. Um, still very much a work in progress right now. I've got a transport layer together, which is how I got thinking about um, all of this parallel signature stuff. Um, server side logic is mostly complete, and I haven't done anything with the, the client side. so. Anyone who's interested in collaborating or uh, providing feedback here, very interested in um, getting this hack together. That is actually the end of my slides. Okay, uh, so we'll go back to the chair slides now. Uh, and I'm about to throw this uh, up in the air and uh, he's gonna call whether he he's uh, uh, going to be uh, blank or have words and whoever um, gets the upside will take red, and whoever gets the downside will take green. And so, sure, words. Words came up. Up here, red. Okay. All right. If you are red, green, colorblind, my apologies. <laughs> the left side is the contrary or red side, and the green side is the uh, pro proponent or green side. Okay, so um, given the, the timetable that's been proposed and we seem to have agreement on, um, the question is what do we do uh, next? Or do we do anything, if anything, next? Um, I'll, I'll point out that the next meeting is November in Seoul, which might, has, you know, might have lesser attendance. Um, but are there any things that we want to consider taking on as new work? Um, do we want to just not meet and declare victory and wait and see what happens. Uh, anyone prepared to make a proposal at this point for what stuff to add? I know, you're supposed to argue red. I'm supposed to argue red, okay, we're done, right? I think it would be great <laughs> if, if the minutes from this meeting had two sentences, which are about to go into last call, recommend no recharter. I, I don't think our AD would have any problem with that. No, pardon me? Whatever the work group wants to do. I, yeah, sure. And, and so now I'll argue the green side, and it's clear that there are some other potential use cases for automated certificate management. We know those now. Recharter to handle those and remain available as a working group for spec bugs and a potential BIS uh, should uh, operational experience show that. So, what are some examples of the use cases? Yeah, I was, I was going to ask um, <laughs> Rich's question. So, how many drafts are there waiting for working group adoption, Ted? Uh, 
Well, there are none now, but we have discouraged anybody from trying to get ahead of the finishing of this one. So there, I, I don't know that there are none sitting in edit buffers waiting for... When a has discouragement ever worked? <laughs> right now. Yeah. Well, so we flipped a coin to see who was going to take which one. Um, <laughs> as, as the green proponent, I have to say, um, there, there clearly are um, cases for certificate management where there is no web server involved. And so some of the challenges are inappropriate to that sort of automated certificate management. People have discussed, for example, creating a, a client certificate mechanism in ACME that would be appropriate to Jabber clients, for example. Um, that, that sort of thing wouldn't be covered by the current set of challenges at all. And it is work we could consider taking on. Now, do, I do not know that anybody has an edit buffer full of this, but this is sort of the... Do, do we want to kick off discussion on the mailing list uh, with the presumption that we're going to close down before Seoul or we're, we're going to send things off before Seoul, but not meet in Seoul because we have no work on our on our plate and we would recharter a new working group before it came up? Or do you want to say, nah, let's be realistic. Once, once somebody's built a building block, people want to build new things with it. Um, we'll presume that those new things come in after this and that starts in Seoul. That's the argument. So... Uh, just to provide people some concrete use cases, other things we might do. The things I've got, I've had in my head and haven't, don't even have an edit buffer right now, uh, where I think there would actually be um, some potential uptake and some real usage are, um, one, doing ACME for EV certificates, um, you know, assuming we get the whole payment thing working and there's some automation to be done. I've, I've talked to some folks who do EV issuance and do automation around EV issuance and they'd be interested. I've got some folks who would be interested in contributing. Um, but like I said, nothing even in a, at a buffer right now. Um, the other thing that I've, I think I've heard the, a few folks mention is the idea of extending the CAA, the CA authorization domain uh, DNS record, um, which currently right now can say, these are the CAs that are authorized to issue for me. I've heard some folks ask to also have an extension of that where you can specify ACME validation mechanisms to whitelist only HTTP validation should be done or only DNS validation should be done. So just to, uh, again, not in an edit buffer, but has been proposed by multiple people. So there might be some interest around that. Um, so yeah, just to give people an idea of what some of these extensions might be. Yeah, Martin Thompson, the reason I got up to ask that question is I'm not actually seeing anything, but thanks to Richard, I'm, I'm seeing a couple of those things. It is perhaps the right plan here to um, use this time to solicit um, at least very rough drafts on those ones so we can sort of get an idea of, of what's out there. And when, we're obviously not closing the working group tomorrow, so um, we do have a little bit of time to collect that, that information. So. Um, once we have, well, once we get to the I point was just where looking at our area director to make sure she wasn't closing the working group tomorrow. <laughs> when, Whenever I'm running, once one we of get these to the point where, nervous. where we're actually done with this document, which yeah it should be fairly soon, we might have a better idea. Yeah. So Kathleen Moriarty and thank you, Martin. I think having some drafts would be good before um, we're actually changing a charter, right? Because then you could sit forever and do nothing. Uh, Phil Humbaker. Yeah, I, I think there are a bunch of application areas as well we've got to think of because uh, ACME was really targeted at TLS. And there's a bunch of other stuff I'd like to do with it. I'd like to be able to use uh, ACME with DNSSEC. I would like to be able to use ACME with SMIME. And there are different uh, authentication challenges that are going to be required. And in the case of SMIME, you want to be able to send and receive the messages over SMTP because, you know, having a, a mail client trying to get certificates mm -hmm. and having to do uh, web transactions doesn't work. Uh, so this is Ted Hardy with a chair hat on, even though I'm standing in the pink box, Mike. Um, I, I have a question to our area director of whether in the cases like that where it's a significantly different application, whether we would like to do it in a working group focused on the, the CA management or focused on the application? That is, would it go to something like LAMPS to do to do this work um, or would it stay here? So Kathleen Moriarty, um, I think it depends if an, uh, a working group exists, right? And if that's the right 
choice or not and what this group wants to do, right? Because you'll have a clean slate when this work is done. So lamps would be a clear case for S-MIME um, and PHP stuff, but I think Philip also said IPsec, right? So. No, DNSSEC, so it would DNS be sec. D okay, DNSOP sorry. or somebody in the Dane community. Right, right, so it might go over, the, right, so I, I think let's just take it case by case and see what comes in, if there's an existing working group or not. Um, sometimes it's not the right place to do that, right? So I have another working group right now that one draft isn't getting enough review, and I think it should have gone over to a different group, and that might happen. Was it relaying from Eric Berger? Um, are there enough drafts or ideas of drafts that they need more than AD sponsored? So I think what I've heard so far is that there's some ideas and we need some drafts and then decisions can be made. So I don't think we're to the point that uh, Eric is at because no, there, there aren't drafts yet. Um, there's ideas and we need to see if those drafts come to fruition and we need to see if we like them and think they should be adopted. Matt Miller, uh, I was just coming up to say yes, I think putting out the word on the list would help the, the discouragement was very effective. I know <laughs> that there were, I know that there were ideas, I do not recall what they were, but even myself and many others said, let's wait until we finish the main work before trying to do anything here. Okay, so it sounds like the resolution of the red green is going to be a kind of a, a light brown mud color um, where we blend them into the uh, request to the mailing list that says, hey, if you've if you had an idea or an edit buffer um, that would be post V1 working group last call um, between, let's say, now and September, uh, try and commit the first electrons um, to paper. Um, and uh, give us a chance to look at that in sort of the September time frame uh, to figure out whether we need to um, meet in Seoul to discuss uh, adoption of new new milestones and, and work items. Um, so uh, having come to the end of that discussion, is there any other business for the good of the order? Hearing none, we're done. Go get you some cookies. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, blue sheets, circulate them, sign them, bring them up.
I'm sure it's, 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 it's used in more than that. I think it's very weird. Or you can actually feel a lot of poop on